We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Welcome again to Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. I'm Marlon Detweiler, and today we have with us Ed Stengel. Ed has been a teacher with us for a long time, but before we get to uh, interviewing Ed, let me just say, as many of you know, Veritas uh, has the largest online classical school in the world. In fact, the largest classical school in the world, and Veritas Scholars Academy, as we call it, or VSA uh, for short, uh, is what it's called. Uh, what many of you may not know uh, is that registration for live online classes opens at the beginning of February this month. Uh, so look for uh, information on that. These classes are a fantastic way to take stress uh, off of your plate as a parent and for your students uh, uh, to learn from expert teachers like Ed, who you'll hear from in just a moment. Um, and uh, you'll see how much uh, he and, and all of our teachers really love uh, what they teach. In this episode, uh, we're giving uh, you a chance to meet uh, Ed. And uh, uh, Ed, we want to welcome you to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I don't remember. I know you've taught for us for a long time. Do you know off the top of your head how many years you've taught online with us? This is year five or six. Okay. I was thinking it was a little bit longer than that. How did you become aware of Veritas and the opportunity to teach online? Yeah, so I was finishing up my master's program in uh, Christian philosophy. And so I was, um, I've loved teaching. Um, this is my 10th year teaching. And so I was always... Um, after another teaching position, and I had never considered online teaching before. Um, I'd always taught in face-to-face -face courses, and one of my fellow students who was graduating with me suggested VSA. Um, her, both of her daughters were there, and she said, you know, this is the perfect place for you. This is the sort of place you'd love, and you get to teach from your home in your home classroom, and I was, I was blown away as I did research uh, into the VSA philosophy and the style of class. It, it fit my personality and what I like doing most uh, the best. I, I was used to having to teach some things I wasn't so passionate about in order to teach the things I liked. And at VSA, I never had to compromise. I was <laughs> offered a chance to teach all the books and philosophy and Christian theology that I could ever want. And uh, what's so nice about VSA is if you want more, you'll always get more uh, yeah, because the student body is constantly growing. and There's a growing uh, appetite for uh, uh, teaching. Yeah, and it's so diverse from all over the world. And so there's there's every year is different. And so that's it's it's so much fun to do. And so yeah, I'm, I'm hooked. Yeah. Now, different people come to teaching for different reasons and from different places. How did your love of teaching and interest in teaching come about? This is a very funny story. Um, so I was an exchange student my junior year of high school in Peru, and I was in a secondary school that had an English department. And so the administration of that school had a very interesting idea that I could go there for free uh, for the entire year. It was a pretty expensive school if I was willing to help out in reforming their English curriculum and helping the English teachers, which you know, at the age of 16 is a pretty wild experience. And so I got a lot of classroom experience through that. And I just, I fell in love with it. I realized how much I enjoyed um, talking back and forth with students, just how rewarding it is to see students' eyes light up as they start to understand things or to see ideas click. And uh, I don't know, ever since I was 16, I just thought this is this is what I'm good at. Like, I, I didn't exactly know quite what I was good at before. But after that, I was like, this is this is what I want to do. Yeah. The um I I know you've taught in four different countries, including of course America. And now teaching in a country is a funny thing because you never know who you're teaching and what well, you do, but uh, you could be teaching somebody from any part of the world. How did it come about that you had such diverse experience in terms of places you've been able to teach? Well, when I was younger, I was kind of squirrely. I was oh, I was really eager to go out and see as many things as I could. Um, and so as soon as I graduated with my bachelor's in uh, education, 
I was already looking overseas to see if there were any opportunities. And uh, I started to work for uh, Sekolah Pelita Harapan, which is a Christian school in Jakarta, Indonesia. And I was exposed to a whole lot of different styles of curriculum there. Uh, one was international baccalaureate. The other one was Cambridge. And they were very difficult to kind of shove into my head uh, and with, with the cultures and everything along with it. But what I didn't realize at the time was that that was putting me through a gauntlet that would kind of make me prepared for our VSA experience where we have students coming from so many different backgrounds, so many different styles of education to where I kind of know generally where they're coming from. And uh, uh, so I can do my best to integrate them into classical style education, which I have found to be you know, by far the best fit for me. And it's just, a, it's, it was fun, uh, exhausting for sure to, to adjust to new cultures. But, you know, now I, a funny thing is my second year here at VSA, I ended up teaching a student who was at the elementary school in Indonesia that I was oh teaching. At. And he recognized me instantly. And when I was introducing myself and showing some pictures of where I live, he's like, oh, I went to your church. Like, oh, I know you. And that was like, and yeah. that, that's happened four times now. I've had students from that school in Indonesia uh, who recognized me. And so uh, I, I think it's fascinating how, you know, VSA's name is becoming commonplace, even in a place like Indonesia, where uh, a lot of people are hungry for something different. That is incredible. I had no idea. How did you, what was your trek to becoming familiar with classical education and finding your own voice in it? Well, my master's program played a very big part. Um, when I signed on to a Houston Christian University's um, Christian apologetics program, it's uh, it's very classical in nature already. Uh, they don't really advertise that, but I was so fortunate that we end up reading from the ancients, from the medievals, from the moderns. It's, it's necessary for everyone. And then you can kind of branch off into uh, different interests. And so I was very interested in the relationship between science and Christianity. I was also very interested in in history and uh, historical Christianity, and so it all just happened to you know very nicely tie into uh, exactly what's going on in the classical education world. And so when I was uh, informed about VSA and informed that I'd be uh, you know probably a good fit for it, that's when I started researching classical education and realized I'd been doing it for three years already without realizing it that you know this is just continuing the tradition that uh, the Christian church and the education that has come from it, you know, for a thousand plus years. Uh, that's incredible. Um, I know uh, that you have quite a following among Veritas families. Students uh, love uh, being in an Ed Stengel class. What do you think, uh, what do you think is the secret to that is? I, I'm sorry to put you in a position to kind of have to beat your own horn here, but we got to understand this. <laughs> well, I think that part of it might be that I am, I'm definitely on the younger side. I'm, I'm 31 this year. And when I started teaching, I was a lot younger 10 years ago. Um, but I think another part of it is, is, and this is another sheer irony is when I first started my education program at my bachelor's level, I said, never middle school said, never, I'll never be good at it. I'm, it's, they're terrifying. I'll never be able to teach <laughs> middle schoolers. And then through Veritas and really through my, my time in Indonesia, I came to realize like middle schoolers are what I'm good at. And that's, that's God's irony, right? Is every time we say God, everything but that, that's yeah. the thing that God's going to say. Yeah, I know the truth. And I, I just realized that there is a certain level of, I don't know, you might even control it, controlled chaos where students who know that you can match their energy levels uh, in certain ways there's uh you kind of have a proving ground for the first week or so of class where they're going to test you as much as they can and if you show them that you're up to the task and that you don't just want to kind of beat them down into submission but you want to kind of harness that energy that enthusiasm that they've got and put it towards something productive you know to where it's you know it's not bad to be goofy in class as long as it's the right kind of goofy as long as it's the goofy that leads to us all understanding Herodotus's histories better because there's some goofy we study some really goofy people like Cambyses in Herodotus like he was he was a crazy man who you know launched cows at his enemies like that's funny it's crazy <laughs> but it's funny and I think that students really appreciate that uh the culture of the classroom online which is you know 
you'd think that it'd be very difficult to build a culture in an online class, but it really isn't that different from a face-to-face -face class in that, you know, every single class at VSA has its own unique characteristic. And so we're all, we're teaching the same curriculum. We're all on board together in the department meeting regularly. And yet every single teacher offers something different uh, for each student. And I think that families love that they get to experiment with different teachers and find which specific teachers match you know, their specific students. And, you know, it's so great here at VSA that we have such a variety of, you know, teacher personalities that there is somebody for everybody. Yeah. Now, you alluded to something that kind of feeds into my next question. That's the whole idea of online teaching. Mm -hmm. My experience is that anyone who has not observed it or experienced live online teaching like what we do, tends to underestimate its effectiveness. I think that's true of a number of people. I know Tom Garfield, our Dean of Academics, was very much, excuse me, what's his, I'm drawing a blank on his title. Uh, but anyway, I think that might be right. Uh, but Tom was, uh, years before he came to work for us, when I served on the ACCS board with him, was very skeptical and he was blown away by what he observed. What do you think it is that causes people to not understand how effective online education is, in some respects considerably better uh, than uh, bricks and mortar? And what is it that causes people to say, aha, oh, I didn't realize that it could be like that? I think part of it is that online education has made huge jumps in probably the last 20 years. I would say that there is still an old paradigm understanding of what an online class is. Um, so for a lot of people, they still think online class is student does work without any interaction with the teacher. Maybe the teacher makes a video or something to teach something indirectly to a student. They might interact on a chat board um, but that it's largely not a personal experience, um, where in reality, you know, when we use a, a software like Adobe Connect, it is a digital classroom with the added benefit that classroom discipline is so much easier. Um, it's so much easier for students to be in a safe environment, because if an environment's not safe, no learning's going to happen. And I've worked in public schools that have been pretty rough in the past, where earnest students who really want to learn uh, really struggle to when there is so much distraction going on in the classroom, whereas in an online environment, uh, it's it's more controlled uh, in terms of safety. And uh, at the same time, you still are getting that face to face. You know, students are on webcam. We're on webcam. We're talking back and forth. Um, there's no shouting uh, in the middle of someone else talking, which is great because you can turn people's mics off if you need to. <laughs> sure. Um, and I think that aha moment comes uh, comes with experience or when they just look at the data and they see how well our students not only perform in school, but once they go to university and after university. Yeah. Um, I remember reading, I believe it was a, a, a Yale study that classical students um, of our specific uh, genre um, outperform students of every other metric that they uh that they were looking at uh, by a lot. That classical education prepares students the best and being having this convenience of being able to have such a high level education wherever you are in the world. If you're a missionary, if you're an international businessman, if you live deep in the country, uh, all of them can tune in to this world-class uh, education uh, and all of them you know, have this level of care that the administration provides for them uh, that frankly would 10 years ago be impossible for them to have. So I think it's a lack of imagination right now that causes that reticence. And I think it's a realization that not only is this like a face-to-face -face class, but in some ways it can be superior, especially with students who tend to be more introverted, um, who tend to really struggle in a crowd. Um, everybody kind of gets their chance to shine in an online classroom. Uh, and as a teacher, man, I, I don't feel even half as destroyed emotionally and energy wise when I'm done with a class, because I mean, the, the, the classroom is just there in, in my home class build or my home class room. And uh, when I'm done, I get to go downstairs and have lunch. I don't have to drive an hour back home. And uh, the students just 
they love learning. You can get students who love learning from everywhere. And I mean, it's a, we, we get dream teams of students in our classes from all over the world of different races and cultures. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. I think it's also true that students who didn't love learning previously grow to love learning too. It, we have seen many, many students come out of their I hate education shell uh, because of the teachers and the personal touch that they provide people like you. One of the things, I think I've touched on this with other in other episodes, but one of the things that really surprised me, you know, I, I knew that online education could be effective. I knew that technology was going to develop. This goes back almost 20 years now. In 2023, we started our 19th year of online classes. Um, and so I knew all those things were going to be the case because I've been around technology long enough to know that you're not going to stay where you are. It's going to get better. That was easy. What I didn't see coming was how important, how significant it was to have a breadth of nations and cultures represented, especially in classes that are discussion-oriented classes, like the great books classes that we call the omnibus. What has been your... Well, statistically speaking, what percentage of your students have been from other countries than America? Any idea? Just a guess. Well, I would I would say that every, every like I said, every single class is different. Sometimes I have a class that is just all uh, Americans. Sometimes I'll have a class that is half Asian. Yeah. Um, the earlier classes tend to be more international um, by far because you know yeah. that's when it's night time for them. Yeah. And so I would I would have to say maybe a solid 30 percent. Wow. Uh, really? In my in my classes, yeah. especially the younger and it's the earlier classes. I, I, I start teaching at 7 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And those Central classes time. are very heavy with Asian students. Yeah. 7 a.m. Central time. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I just want to make sure that people understand. That. Yeah. Because we uh, we're working on expanding our hours because we want to be increasingly convenient to mm -hmm. people that are in very different time zones. I, I live and uh, sit today in the eastern time zone and you sit in the central time zone. And that's where a lot of people are from. We get that. Most of them are in America. But 30 percent come from other countries. That's incredible. How would you describe how that makes classes better, more rich in terms of discussion and interaction. It's so fascinating when we ask cultural questions in, in omnibus class, especially when, you know, and I ask, what does your culture think of this? And so what does your culture think of the objectivity of good and evil? What do they think a good life is? And you'll have a Chinese student who has a completely different answer. One that most students, you know, a 12 year old, student in the United States may ne never consider how a Chinese family might think. And now suddenly it's not strange to them. It's not foreign to them. They have personal face-to-face -face experience with all these people from different cultures in the world, and they didn't even have to travel there for it. And so, you know, this ability to make friends with people halfway around the world as if you're in the same room together, um, it definitely makes, especially in the Christian world, it it really connects us to the church all over. And, you know, some issues that we may have as Christians in the United States, well, they might have the polar opposite issue uh, in a place like China. And so getting to hear about what we hear on the news straight up from somebody who who lives there, um, that's an invaluable experience. I mean, I and they're, what's going on uh, in their part of the world in this you know historical discussion that we're having, um, it is... I get to learn so much every, I always make the joke to my students. I said, you're paying me so that you can teach me, you know, about <laughs> your culture and about how you view these, I, these things. And so you yeah. give me a wider viewpoints. And uh, so I'm just conning you into teaching me. Every time I ask you a question, <laughs> I'm genuinely want to know what you think about it. And uh, so, you know, jokes on you, I, you, you end up teaching me so much and uh, you know, hopefully I teach you something as well. Uh, but it, there, there's an exchange in this online format that just isn't possible, even in an international school. Yeah, well, it's clearly the case. I, I've seen this in the teaching that I've done, and I'm not a teacher, but I've done some teaching, that the teacher always learns the most. Hmm. Yeah, I yeah. would say so. Um, now you have, you, most of your teaching, maybe all of it at the moment, 
his teaching in the great books curriculum, our omnibus curriculum. Uh, why do you, where did your love for that, for the canon of Western civilization, the great books as we tend to call them, where did your love for those books come from and why is it, how do you see that as valuable today? Yeah, um, and I actually wrote about this uh, in Epistula at one point a few years ago, which is our um, our kind of blog publication for, yeah. for teachers and administrators to write in. And uh, I kind of talked about this. Um, I did not really get to experience almost any of the great books in my education growing up. I think that we probably neither read did one, or, yeah, did one or two books yeah. a year um, is what we got. Um, we would read little tiny portions of Shakespeare, but it was obvious my teacher didn't like it and didn't want to do it. And when a teacher doesn't like what they're teaching, it's just blaringly obvious. And you're never going to get into anything that your teacher's not into. And so I went through my entire high school years and most of my undergrad years just not having an appreciation uh, for the great books. I remember, and I, I wrote about, this is what I wrote about in Epistule, is I, I picked up Dante's Divine Comedy when I was maybe a junior in my undergrad. And I opened it up and I didn't understand anything. I didn't understand the references. The, the language was archaic because it was the Wordsworth translation. I didn't, I didn't know what translation I was supposed to read because I had no background. And I thought, this just isn't for me. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe, maybe I just don't have what it takes to read these books. Like, what a shame. And then I put it away. And it was only when I began my master's program and Dante's Divine Comedy was a part of what we were required to read for a class. I'm like, all right, well, I've got to become the sort of person who understands this. And so we read a much more uh, modern uh, translation, the, the Musa translation, uh, which is what we read uh, in my omnibus class as well. And it just suddenly... I realized that there is something special about these works. Um, they're not, it's not just nepotism from, you know, people promoting their ancestors or something of the sort, like I had kind of been told, that there is something divinely special about many of these works. You can see the hands of God in how these works came to be, and there's a reason why we still have them today, and that the, the lessons that we learn, not only about history, but about what it means to be human, what it means to be made in the image of God and, you know, suffering from sin, we are inheriting the entirety of what humanity has experienced up until this point. And what a tragedy it would be if students did not get to experience this, if they were not given the tools um, to be changed by this work. Um, I, I love to tell the story. I came to Christianity. I became a full believer uh, because of um, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, uh, which is, you know, in the canon of great literature. It's a little bit too long for us to cover in the omnibus program, but it's one. It's it's in my list of books that are not book. omnibus books it is that you should book. read once yeah. you leave. Yeah. And uh, and I just remember the experience of Christianity being made so raw uh, in the experience of Jean Valjean in that book, and it just suddenly made sense to me where it, where it never did before. I I had this moment where I realized like, wait, there is no middle road to faith. Either you walk this road and you can't see what's ahead of you, but you've got to walk it or you got to go the other way because you can't just stand in the middle. And it, and that impact into my life, I always explain it as the world was black and white and it became color after that moment. Um, and that's an experience that I want to, to the best of my ability, to be able to give to our students. And a lot of students are terrified when they see these big books and they're like, oh, I'm going to hate it or my sibling hated this book, so I'll hate it too. And I'm like, oh, you won't. You definitely won't. Now, in the end, if you read it and you say, you know what? I prefer other works to this. That's perfectly fine. But every single one of these works has something to say to you. And you've got to interact with it. You've got to dialogue with these works. They're not just going to beat you over the head. You've got to uncover it. And it's yeah. it's treasure. And I, and I see us in the classical world, you know, we are kind of treasure bearers to these people. And and it doesn't matter your race or your culture. This is the, the story of humanity. We're going all over the world. I always tell people in Omnibus One, I don't think we have a single white European showing up the whole time, except with Shakespeare at the very end, because this is this is all of us in humanity. We, these, these identity issues uh, that the modern world keeps struggling with, that's not what we're not really concerned with that sort of thing. We're concerned in what makes us human, what makes us made in the image of God, what makes us you know, uh, the Church of Christ. It's and wonderful to rise above some of the silliness, isn't it? Um, oh, and so many of my students are all different races. Yeah. And it's yeah. great. 
Yeah. What uh, can you give an example? Obviously, don't name names, but can you give an example of growth and transformation in a student as a result of uh, uh, participating in an omnibus class? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have a perfect example in my mind. Um, a few years ago, I had a student who had been kicked out of uh, the school that they were in. They were in a private. I don't know if it was a classical school. They were kicked out of school for bad behavior um, because they were constantly arguing with teachers. They were constantly uh, neglecting their work. And uh, they came into this class and they kind of, you know, they started out kind of bragging about how bad they were in school. And I, <laughs> instead of just like hammering them, um, I kind of slowly ushered them into our culture here, which is, you know, the the bad, you know, being a bad guy is is not going to be seen as cool here. But instead, you know, we have yeah. a very supportive group of students who they love what they're learning and they love seeing other people learning. And these are these are kids who will get a formal debate set up on a Saturday morning that no teacher's involved in and all the students from class will come to and then very respectfully like digitally shake hands and be like, whoa, you made such great points there. And this student's transformation, they, I think got a 98% in that class. Wow. They did fantastic. Their, theirs was the first hand up almost for every question. Uh, <laughs> their projects were incredible because this student was so intelligent and they were not being challenged in their old school. And I guess nobody asked the question, why, why, are, why are they acting out? Are, are they bored? Do they need more responsibility? Are they upset that they're not being taken seriously? Because Omnibus takes every single student seriously. Yeah. You know, you, you we treat them like true thinkers. They're not just a student to be, you know, have something shoved into their heads. They're a serious thinker from day one. And uh, if they, they got to rise to that challenge and this student, man, they did it. I'm, it's, it's, it's one of my uh, one of my proudest moments. But we have so many uh, stories like that. Yeah. Students who weren't challenged in other places and they find where they belong and they feel like they belong. And I didn't have a single behavior problem with him the entire year. It, it's it's amazing uh, how effective the culture of positive peer pressure, love for our neighbor, student to student, obviously teacher to student and student to teacher, but student to student also and what that does to draw in people because they get to a place, they're in an environment where everybody wants to learn and they know they can be trusted. Yeah. It's really cool. Well, I've saved one of my most important questions for last. Uh, you play in a folk group called Pawns and <laughs> or Kings. Yes. And you play something uh, in addition to the banjo and guitar called the Irish Penny Whistle. Now, I could have Googled it, but I wanted to hear it from you. What is an Irish penny whistle? So an Irish penny whistle, historically speaking, is a it's an instrument that Irish people could afford during uh, during the time of famine. And so it's it's largely considered an Irish instrument because it was made of tin. Tin is super uh, was super inexpensive in this era. And uh, and so it was made of tin and it's a very rudimentary instrument. I think it's got just eight holes in it. Uh, I have I have one right here actually. Always have one available, I suppose. I, so I this... was going to ask you. We didn't set this <laughs> up. I want people that are listening to know that I didn't have you set ready. But I'm going to ask you to play it. <laughs> well, well, I might be able to. So this one's in the key of C. Uh, I don't know if this one's full of dust or not, but. Uh oh, we lost our sound a little bit. Just at the yeah, right time, the yeah, sound I'll, I'll, come through. If you can play it toward the microphone a little closer. Yeah, let me. I'll, I'll try that again. Ah, the uh, the computer doesn't like it for some reason. Yeah, I have a noise canceller that's in the AI of my uh, my microphone, and I'm wondering if this is it's picking it up as breathiness. I think it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it's it's a shame. We will have uh, to come hear you live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i suppose so but uh but yeah it's a it's a great instrument because you can pick it up for 10 bucks uh, anywhere <laughs> and um and it, well, you, you hear it in the Lord of the Rings great. soundtrack and in irish traditional music and so weird instruments have always been my favorite i can actually show you my newest one that i'm most proud of and uh, it's out of tune so don't ask me to play okay. it for right now but this is wow, called a beautiful woodwork what is that 
uh, it's called a hurdy-gurdy. It's a medieval instrument. Um, okay. I played it for my students a little while ago. One of the one of the things about it is it's like 20 degrees outside. And so when humidity disappears, it, it falls out of tune. Um, but yeah, I, I waited for three years for this to be handmade. Um, There's it's a, a, it's, a rock song from the 60s that refers to the hurdy-gurdy. Hurdy -gurdy man. I'm old enough to know it. I'm trying to think. <laughs> Uh, he he also sang Mellow Yellow. I can't think of the guy. He was an Englishman. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the one that sang it. I can't think of his name. But anyway, uh, we've I, run I, out I, of time. I, Ed, thank you so much uh, for joining absolutely. us. Thank you for what you do at BSA. Uh, Ed is one of uh, 160 some, maybe even more teachers. And uh, we have so many teachers like Ed that love what they do. And it comes through and it impacts students like you can't believe so if you're interested in speaking with an expert about our live online classes uh, and course options, you can go to veritaspress.com forward slash consult. And there you can uh, provide the information that you need to have somebody contact you and, and describe to you what it might be like for your children to be a part of it. Ed, thank you for joining us, folks. This has been Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Take care.